Okay, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. We are going to be talking in today's session about genetics and familial hypercholesterolemia, which is um, basically cholesterol. And we'll be joined again by Dr. Cheval Kapadia, who was with us last week for our webinar on genetics and cardiomyopathy. And if you would like to view that webinar, you can do that on our Mended Hearts YouTube channel. Um, but thank you again, Dr. Kapadia, for being here two weeks in a row. We're very lucky. Before we start the webinar, I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping items. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So if you have any questions, you will not be able to ask them verbally. Just type them into the Q&A box, and we will address them at the end of the session. There'll be lots of time for the doctor to answer your questions. Um, keep in mind, though, that questions about your specific condition or treatment cannot be answered on this webinar, but we encourage you to go back to your healthcare team and ask those questions there. And then this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel probably by tomorrow or Monday. And now just to introduce Dr. Kapadia, he is a Richmond cardiologist with James River Cardiology, and he's been in practice for over 25 years. He's a passionate about, he is passionate about early detection and prevention of cardiovascular disease and chronic heart failure. He received his medical degree from the University of Virginia, and he completed his residency in internal medicine at the Medical College of Virginia. He went on to complete a fellowship in cardiology at Brown University at Rhode Island Hospital in Providence, and he's board certified by the American Board of Cardiovascular Disease. Dr. Kapadia is a community leader and professional resource in the fields of cardiac wellness and disease prevention, and he's been providing cardiology care to patients in Richmond for over 20 years. During that time, he's given numerous talks and se seminars to his fellow doctors and the community, and he's been voted top doc in Richmond Magazine multiple times by his peers. So thank you, Dr. Kapadia, for being here again. And one more thank you. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that this has been provided to you today through an educational grant from AstraZeneca, Edwards Life Sciences, and Novartis. And last but not least, if you're on today but you're not yet a member, you can join Mended Hearts, Young Mended Hearts, or Mended Little Hearts by going to our website at mendedhearts.org. Memberships start at zero dollars. All right, Dr. Kapadia, I'll invite you to go ahead and share your screen and begin the presentation. Okay. All right, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so Mandy and Tammy and, and, the, and the team at Mended Hearts, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and so uh, I don't know how many of you heard me last week, and uh, so I'm back again uh, for an encore performance, but this time talking about something that I, I, I'm really passionate about, and it's, it's, it's lipid management and coronary artery disease. And we're going to kind of focus in on uh, a niche condition uh, called familial hypercholesterolemia, right? So it's, it's a genetic condition that really drives atherosclerotic disease. Um, and so this is a, an area that I, I do a lot of work with uh, and look forward to sharing, you know, uh, this information with you all. So sometimes I, I get on a soapbox. And so I, I think I'm just going to preface this with a little bit of a preamble on healthcare today and where it should be and it's happening. Uh, but the, the, the current state of healthcare in the United States is one that's fairly reactive, wait till it's broke, kind of cookbook, one size fits all and patriarchal, right? So uh, if you think about all those different pieces and the future state, which is the should be the now state and uh, not everywhere, but happening should be one that P's, right? The five P's, proactive, preventative, personalized, precision, and participatory, right? That's where there's a partnership between the doctor and the patient and, you know, their shared decision-making uh, about, about problems. And I think that's really, really important. That's, that's, that's part of the healing and the ther therapeutic uh, activity. And we have the tools today, right, to be able to deliver personalized precision medicine. And genetics is 
one piece of that, an important piece of that, so that we can get ahead and find uh, pathology, abnormalities, and have awareness and deal with it, whether it's lifestyle changes, diet changes, um, or even medications at an earlier age to maintain not only longevity, but also health span, right? That's so, so we want to live longer, but we want to live longer, healthier. So that's, I, that's, that's the way, and that's my mindset. And I think that's where medicine uh, 3.0 is, is headed. So cholesterol, uh, and just to bust, bust some myths here is that cholesterol is not a bad word, right? It, it, it's not a four letter word. Uh, it's, we couldn't live without cholesterol. It's part of our cell membranes. It's part of steroid hormones, vitamin D, bile acids. Uh, it is, is integral to, to survival as humans. Uh, and about 10, 15% of cholesterol kind of hangs out in the blood. And if it's the wrong kind, then it can start to create mischief and cause plaque in the lining of the arteries. So, you know, the body makes whatever cholesterol it needs. Some cholesterol comes through the diet and it's not really the cholesterol that drives high cholesterol, right? It's, it's, it's sort of the, the American diet, uh, the, the, the standard American diet or the sad diet, uh, which is unfortunately a big cause of uh, atherosclerotic uh, disease, heart attack, strokes, diabetes, obesity in the United States. So um, what we're going to focus on is not sort of the generic high cholesterol, but really focus on the genetic drivers of high cholesterol that can cause premature onset of, of heart disease in our children and how to think about and frame that uh, uh, conversation a little bit differently. So that's, that's the first uh, thing to understand. Um, some key cholesterol numbers to, to, to understand and know, right? These are things that when you approach your physician that you should be asking and, and know, right? ApoB, right? So the first thing is that cholesterol, and many of you may know this or you may not know this, uh, but cholesterol is this waxy substance that can't fro float freely in the blood. The liver makes most of it. Every cell makes cholesterol, but the liver makes the most. And the liver packages these uh, cholesterol into, into protein particles called ApoB. And ApoB then transports cholesterol and triglycerides, which is like the cream in the blood, and targets it to the various organs to do what they need to do. But if there's too much cholesterol floating around in the wrong kind, then it can start to cause plaque in the heart arteries, right? So the arteries, and we have hundreds of thousands of miles of arteries feeding various organs. And the, you can think about the lining of the arteries as Teflon. Uh, they're actually an active organ. It's the largest organ in our body, the endothelium. And that lining of the artery should be like Teflon. Nothing should stick to it, but something causes plaque uh, injury. And then cholesterol, if it's abnormal, starts to collect inside, gets oxidized, gets inflamed, and there you have a uh, plaque. And that's the genesis of that, right? It starts in the wall of the artery, a soft plaque, and then builds up outwards and then can, can come in and, and, and cause narrowing in your heart arteries, in our arteries that feed the brain, our kidney arteries, anywhere that blood flows to. So numbers to think about are, are really to know, are your, what is your ApoB? That's the protein uh, that carries uh, cholesterol the non-HDL cholesterol, which is a, a, a calculated number, your LDL-C cholesterol, triglycerides, and then a genetic marker called LP little a, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But there's no such thing as bad, good and bad cholesterol technically. Cholesterol is cholesterol. There's only one kind of cholesterol. And it just depends on which protein particle it, it's carried in. So LDL transports cholesterol to various uh, organs and HDL, the quote unquote good cholesterol is actually a protein that transports cholesterol back to the liver, back to other areas, can take out cholesterol from uh, blood vessels. So they're just, think of them as carriers or, or trucks or transport mechanisms uh, that traffic cholesterol to and from uh, the liver. So this is the structure, it's a cartoon looking at the various kinds of uh, cholesterol particles 
and they all have this protein ApoB involved. And so the most common thing is LDL, but there are, are particles called IDL or intermediate density lipoprotein or VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. And then you have chylomicrons. Uh, and there's one ApoB per particle, right? So that that's really important to, to understand. So ApoB is the most important number. Uh, honestly, most physicians probably don't know this. Um, then there's a there's a, the bad actor called LP little a or lipoprotein little a. This is a genetically uh, driven uh, LDL particle that has uh, extra part attached to it. And you can see that in the right side that attaches itself to the ApoB particle. And when that happens, that puts someone at higher risk long term for heart attack and strokes. And so um, we'll talk a little bit more about LP little a, but it's not, it's an important marker to know uh, because uh, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox now that can help reduce risk. And then in the, in the future, um, drugs that actually lower LP little a. And then the next, uh, for those of you that were here last week with me uh, with the genetics and cardiomyopathy talk, uh, you saw this slide. So I just want to, preface just to for those that are new is is genetics 101 so when we think about genes how they're inherited is really important right is it autosomal dominant uh, so that does, does that that means that one parent has an abnormal gene and another parent doesn't and so their offspring have a 50 percent chance of getting that uh, abnormal gene recessive means is both parents have the abnormal gene and then uh, both both uh, 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 the offspring will get will get the gene no matter what. Um, so there's so all this stuff is uh, is really important. So then there's pathogenicity. So just because you have the gene, um, and when you measure the gene, is it pathogenic? Is it likely to cause illness? Likely pathogenic, benign, likely benign, and then this sort of gray zone, which is big of variance of, of uncertain significance. So that's the challenge of genetic testing, right? It's there, there, there is a lot of good signal, but there is some noise there as well. And when it comes to genetic counseling, that's an important piece to help people relieve anxiety. So I think there's a lot of positives we'll talk about at the end, and but there are a few negatives of genetic testing. And then something called genotype versus phenotype, right? What does that mean? So the genotype is is basically your blueprint. What are you born with? And genes code proteins and proteins then kind of determine the expression of whatever good or bad state might happen. The phenotype is the clinical expression of that. So for example, if you have a gene for cystic fibrosis, the phenotype is uh, patients with respiratory issues and that type of thing. So the phenotype is the expression of that gene. And they're not always a one-to-one -one relationship. And so that comes, there are two terms that are important called penetrance and expressivity. So Penetrance refers to the percentage of, of people whose genotype then translates into, into a phenotype, into some pathology. And then expressivity is that within that phenotype, there's a lot of variability in, in the expression of that, of, of that gene, right? Some people might have a mild version of the disease and some might have a severe uh, version of that disease, so that 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 refers uh, refers to expressivity. So that's a really important. These are important terms. So just because you have a gene doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. So familial hypercholesterolemia, terribly common, but still is the most common monogenic. So monogen uh, monogenic means one gene, autosomal dominant disorder. So monogenic. Uh, that means there's also polygenic. So polygenic means multiple genes involved. And a lot of our diseases today that we think about are uh, polygenic. You probably heard a story on NPR this past week, if you were listening, that there is a, a gene therapy for sickle cell anemia. So gene uh, sickle cell anemia is a single gene abnormality. And by using the CRISPR technology, they were able to fix that gene and thus fix the condition uh, potentially. So familiar hypercholesterolemia is the most common monogenic autosomal dominant disorder, okay? Then there's two versions of that, heterozygous and homozygous. So heterozygous 
is you have one gene uh, containing the abnormality, the cholesterol, and the other that is not. And homozygous means you've got two copies. So both your parents uh, were gave you a copy of this thing. And that's that's exceedingly rare. But heterozygous is actually not as uncommon as we think. So it's one in 300 individuals. And we'll learn later that it's and it, it's not as clean cut in terms of diagnosis with just clinical parameters. Why is this important? Because people with these two conditions, particularly uh, these conditions, higher risk of premature, meaning really early onset cardiovascular disease. And if you see 18 times higher than the general population, homozygous, they, uh, uh, people in their 20s start to have heart attacks, strokes. It's terrible. It's pretty rare. And it's detected very early. Heterozygous can manifest much later, probably in the 40s and 50s uh, with, with events. Okay. So the clinical presentation here is that, as I said, that homozygous, HO, uh, uh, presents a lot earlier and heterozygous pre presents in middle age. And so one of the markers of coronary artery disease is a test uh, called a CT heart scan looking for coronary artery calcifications. And typically I use that a lot to diagnose or to screen patients. I, I, I call it a mammogram for cardiovascular disease to look for plaque uh, in the heart arteries by measuring coronary uh, calcium. And in, in folks that are heterozygous, they can start to manifest plaque that's calcified uh, a lot sooner. Most of us that have normal high cholesterol, if we're prone to or to develop um, plaque, we'll start to develop soft plaque in our 20s and 30s in our cell, in our artery walls, and then the calcification may happen in our 40s and 50s. So clearly this disease is happening a lot earlier. The LDL tends to be much, much higher than the general population above 190 milligrams per deciliters. And they tend to have some clinical features, not always, that can give us a clue that uh, the disease is present. So that's called xanthomas. So if you look at this picture on the knuckles, you can see some yellowish uh, kind of discoloration um, on, the, on the tendons of the, of the knuckles. It's also present on the Achilles heel uh, and then there's something called uh, uh, arcosinolus, which is basically, you can see this arc above in the cornea, and that also represents fatty deposits in the cornea that can be a clue for this condition. So let's talk about the genes, right? We, we know there are the, the three most common gene types that cause FH, and I'm just going to call it FH because to say familial hypercholesterolemia is quite a mouthful. So FH... Um, there's an LDL receptor gene, there's an ApoB gene, and there's a PCSK9 gene. The most common is the LDR gene, and that's about 90% of genetically identified FH cases. And then the other two, you know, comprise a, a, a small um, a percentage of that. Uh, it's probably above the details of this, uh, in terms of all of that, I think it's probably just beyond the scope of this talk and would require a separate talk. But I'm going to show you some pictures just to give you an idea of where these where these things work. So if you look at the top here, that's the cell membrane. LDR refers to the LDL receptor. So the whole idea of cholesterol clearing is that on the liver cell, there are these LDL receptors, and their job is to clear out cholesterol from the bloodstream, right? And then internalize it and package it and then do whatever it needs to do. So um, if you have insufficient LDL receptors on the, on the surface of the cell, you're gonna have less clearing of cholesterol and your cholesterol is gonna be a lot higher, right? So if there's something wrong with the receptor complex, that could result in less clearing, higher levels of cholesterol, that can lead to higher uh, incidence of plaque in the blood vessel. Then there's another protein called PCSK9, and it's important to know, know that term because we'll come back to it when it comes to therapeutics at the end, you know, or potential therapeutics. 
is a protein. So in nature, in, in, in our biology, there's always something that is building something up and there's always a counterbalancing, breaking something down. So PCSK9 is a protein that actually binds to the LDL receptor and, and internalizes and prevent it from uh, grabbing more cholesterol. There's always checks and balances going on in biology. So when there is a mutation in the PCSK9, either there's PCSK9 going on or too little. And if there's too much PCSK9 in the blood or in the cell, then you're going to have degradation of the LDL, LDL receptor. And thus you're going to have a lot more cholesterol floating around in the bloodstream. Uh, and so an ApoB, if there's a problem with ApoB, remember that's the protein that carries the, the cholesterol if there's a problem with that attaching to the LDL receptor, if there's some genetic abnormality, then there's not going to be a connection, right? So if, if the ApoB particle can't connect with the LDL receptor, you know, very much like how a shuttle connects to the, uh, you know, the uh, space station, there's not going to be, those passengers aren't going to get into the space station. And that's not going to be a good thing. So that, those are the potent, potential uh, abnormalities. And those are the top three. There's, there's, there's lots of others, but those are the top three. So if we look at cholesterol, and you guys have had cholesterol testing in yourself and family members, you've seen that there's a whole spectrum. And for common high cholesterol in the United States, we're looking at anywhere from 120 to 150 milligrams per deciliter, but it can, it can go even wider, right? Uh, uh, across without a, a being FH, so 150 to 200. Then heterozygous FH kind of runs the gamut of, you know, 200 to all the way 500 and homozygous is kind of in the 500 range. And there's lots of different mutations that can, can cause this. So, and what's really interesting is that born, our LDL cholesterols are super low. They're sub 100, probably in the 50 or 60 range. And as we grow and become adults, they start to increase and in some more than others. Well, in folks that have these genetic mutations, their LDL cholesterol is high from the get-go. And so their, their lifelong exposure to high cholesterol is much, much longer uh, than, than the rest of us without genetic defects. I'm not gonna get too much into this, but just know that there's different ways to think about it. So a single person could have one gene from a parent with an abnormality uh, uh, and another gene with a different abnormality. And so there's so many different variations here. Um, and even with the same gene, there can be lots of different variations in the expression of that gene. Uh, so that makes it a little bit challenging. So how do you identify patients that might have FH, right? And we're, we're, we're really, for purpose of this, this discussion, talking about heterozygous FH. So there are several different diagnostic criteria and they're good, but they're imperfect. And I'll, I'll eventually get back to why that is. But, you know, knowing if someone in their family has had heart disease at a young age, right? That's super important. Uh, so less than say 50 for a man, less than 60 for a woman. And the reason it's different for men and women is because estrogen is protective. And so there's a 10 year advantage that women have uh, with respect to, to manifestations of, of, of heart disease. But family history, getting that is often challenging, but, and it's really important that it's first degree relative, right? We're not talking about your second cousin once removed. We're talking about your first degree relative. So that would be your parents, your siblings, your offspring. Those are first degree relatives uh, when it comes to, you know, looking at other people that have, might have had this condition, right? So if they've had some sort of clinical heart event. Um, the patient themselves, if you've had a heart attack or something at a young age, that's really important, right? So as we think about that, and then is there anything on the exam side? And we talked about the xanthomas and Arcus Cornelius. So those are some other features that also are clues, but those are fairly variable. And honestly, I, I I have seen very few of these uh, in my career over the past 20 plus years. And then looking at the range of cholesterol, you know, as you can see there. So you you're, you get points for all of these things. And if you 
if you have enough points and that puts you in a high risk probable category for FH, right? And then there's DNA analysis that can, that give you a lot of points uh, to figure that out. So this is a good clinical screening tool, tool even without the DNA analysis, but it's not perfect. Um, there's another one that's called Simon Brune, and I won't go into the details of that. Uh, you can see that and see that on the um, eventually when it's posted on the on the website. Uh, but it, it it goes to the same sort of things, right? It's it's biomarkers looking at cholesterol levels, the presence of clinical uh, of uh, physical features, DNA, family history. So kind of the same similar ways of looking at FH. This graph is really kind of gives us a really good perspective and kind of highlights what I said about cumulative lifetime LDL exposure, right? So if you're homozygous you, and you have super high cholesterols, you're going to have events very young in life, right? So, and you can see the blue graph here that their cholesterol by the time they're two or three starts to, to skyrocket uh, very high. And so, you know, that needs to be treated whether it's, you know, and there's a variety of treatments around that. And then we look at the most common, which is the heterozygous FH, right? So the, the red line kind of looks at folks that are untreated and their cholesterol starts to increase quite significantly. So right by the time they're in their 20s and even in their 30s, they're starting to have very elevated cholesterol. In contrast, if you look at the orange, uh, line below without FH, the, the numbers, the curves are displayed differently. So the same person, if you look at someone that, that 30 years of age, um, without FH, their LDL might be 60. Uh, with FH, their LDL is already, you know, double that, right? And, um, and then if you look at the, the blue and the purple graphs, those are people that are treated with uh, different levels of, of statin drugs. So you can start to bend the curve and the earlier start treatment, whatever that treatment might be, you start to bend the curve in terms of events and you decrease the cumulative exposure uh, of, of, of LDL. So I, I mentioned this early on and there's another you know, quirk here called lipoprotein little a or, or fondly known as LP little a. And this is a highly atherogenic, so the term atherogenic likely to cause plaque in the arteries, lipoprotein that is uh, genetically driven. And there is a higher incidence in patients with, uh, with uh, heterozygous FH, uh, high LP little a's are independently associated with uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease. Um, and I check it in everyone, you know, with all my, my cholesterol panels. It doesn't cost very much and it can give you a lot of information of uh, uh, of how to manage people, how to manage people earlier and more aggressively. Um, you tend to see it in uh, more in African Americans in the United States, uh, but also in South Asian populations uh, have a lot of expression of LP little a. So this is something that is I've been following for years. There's kind of renewed interest in in LP little a now uh, because there are some interesting therapeutics that are in clinical trials uh, looking at lowering LP little a. So why genetic testing, right? So, you know, hey, we, we're just going to, what, what, what are the pros of, of, of testing patients for genes, right? It's kind of a hassle. You got to get blood, you got to get a, a cheek squab or saliva. And was it, what is it really going to tell us that, uh, um, that we don't already know and that we're already gonna treat anyway, right? Um, and I'll kind of go through thinking of this and, and, and it's evolved over time, right? So the, the first is to establish or confirm a definitive diagnosis of FH. And the reason that's important is that FH can have variable expressivity, meaning the LDL isn't always 190, right? Uh, and part of that is that um, over the years, we're using a lot more statins. A lot more people are on statins, so their LDL might be lower. Our diets are maybe a bit better, 
And so the LDLs may not be as high. And then there may be variability anyway in terms of the LDL number in any given person. Um, so that's, that, that's, a, that's one reason. Um, genetic testing provides additional prognostic information and refined risk stratification. So what does that mean? And I'll show you a graph in just a little bit that kind of highlights this. But if you compare a person with of cholesterol uh, across the different cholesterol levels, the folks that have FH diagnosed genetically have a higher, much higher incidence and risk of, of, of uh, coronary artery disease, uh, MI, uh, heart attacks, and whatnot. And so it adds incremental information to to know that you need to to attack these people, you know, much more aggressively. And I'll show you a graph of that. That'll be very apparent when you have genetic testing. You know, and I, I find this true of other testing. When I show someone that they have a calcium score of 100 or uh, 500 and and I show them they have LP little a suddenly they're more aware and they're more likely I'm more likely to treat them aggressively they're more likely to the patients are more likely to be receptive to taking the medication there's better adherence and as a result lower LDL uh, lowering so that's really important um, the opportunity for earlier treatment and lifestyle modification so this is super super important remember I showed you these curves so if you are a patient and then you have the disease and you're getting your family members, you're getting your kids tested and your children have uh, uh, an LDR receptor uh, mutation and they've got high cholesterol, think about if you start to treat this person a lot sooner with or without medication, but however you do it, you're decreasing their exposure to high LDL cholesterol at a much earlier age and really can bend the curve. Uh, so it, it provides the opportunity to do pharmacotherapy, lifestyle modification much earlier. Uh, and cascade testing refers to that, right? So cascade testing is the idea you have, you're the patient, you have a gene, uh, you have FH, we've identified the gene, and now you can start testing at-risk family members, right? Whether it's, and it will start with the first degree family members, but now, once you have a, a gene associated with that condition, you can start to uh, test second and third degree family members. So that, that's super good. And you can exclude people that you think might have FH. If they have a negative uh, genotype, then, you know, uh, that uh, looks convincingly benign, then they're probably in a good, good situation. So this is, the, this is a really important graph that I think, you know, I, that I think really impacted the way I'm thinking about this. So you, if you look at any sort of degree of quartile of, of LDL cholesterol, those that had the FH mutation had a significantly higher risk of coronary artery disease events, right? So, uh, and even if you start to look at, wow, someone with an LDL less than 30 or an LDL of 130 to 160, has a two to four fold risk of, uh, of uh, CV events. And then of course it increases dramatically as the numbers go up. So that's the added incremental benefit of, of gene testing in that population. And you can see it's a cross and there are folks that are positive even at lower levels. So if you look at, um, so those that, uh, if a patient has FH and you do the testing, right? If they're positive, then you go ahead and treat them and treat them aggressively. Uh, if they're um, negative, then you know that's great. And then you may want to look at other alternative things that might be driving their cholesterol. Checking their LP little a. There's another gene called ApoE, uh, which also has implications for cardiovascular disease, but also dementia. Um, and you know, you you may or may not want to treat these people more aggressively uh, based on all that, but it, it is good information. Uh, obviously, if they have the genotype and they have the phenotype, boom, you go and treat them aggressively. Um, and then in cascade testing, you know, if you've got a family member that has the gene, 
but doesn't have anything clearly suggestive of FH at that point, you can monitor their LDL and watch them and then decide at some point when to pull the trigger on treatment. So there's, there's a huge benefit in genetic testing um, in this situation. So before I go to therapeutics, you know, what are the, I mentioned the pros of genetic testing. The cons of genetic testing are anxiety. Um, okay, I have a gene. Now what do I do? Am I fated to have this problem? Could it create more anxiety? And the answer is yes. And that's why there are genetic gene counselors, genetic counselors. And some of the, 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 the companies that offer genetic testing, like in Vitae, and uh, it was one that I use, and there, there are a bunch of others. They also provide access to, to genetic counseling, and that's super, super important to help uh, people manage that, right? So, you know, there, there's the pro there, and, and, and the science is imperfect, but it's getting better all the time. It's getting cheaper. It's much more accessible. And so, um, and the good news with, with, with genes is that there's a lot, in a lot of conditions, there are a lot of things that we can do to, to mitigate risk uh, of future disease. So I still think the pros way outweigh the cons, but it's important to understand, you know, from the patient perspective, from the family member perspective uh, of the implications of, uh, of gene testing. So what's the point of doing all this testing if you, if you can't treat them, right? So that's where therapeutics really are super important. And for decades, all we had was statins, right? When I was a fellow, uh, at Brown, the 4S trial came out, which is a simvastatin trial. And that was the first landmark trial that showed that statin drugs actually make an impact on people that have had heart attacks. Before then, it was it was a big question mark. So that was in 1994. And, you know, since then, there have been decades of, of, of uh, research and uh, positive research into the statins. There's a lot of negative press around statins. And I think a lot of the is, uh, I think what what's what's out there officially in terms of side effects, joint aches, muscle aches, cognitive dysfunction is small, but it's not insignificant. And um, and I think a lot of it's dose dependent and statin type of statin related. My workhorse statin is rosuvastatin, and honestly, if any of you have been on this medication, you know the dose ranges from five to forty milligrams a day. And I usually start at five to 10 milligrams. You're going to get the biggest bang for your buck at, at those doses. And going up in the dose gives you maybe five to 7% extra uh, LDL reduction. But the, the risk of adverse events and side effects increases significantly. So rosuvastatin is my go-to statin. It has, it has the best data, in my opinion. Uh, it's generic, and that's great. Um, if people have tried lots of statins and they get aches and pains, there is one statin called patavastatin or Livolo that we use for statin intolerant folks. And that seems to work pretty well. Um, I use CoQ10 to sometimes mitigate uh, side effects, 100 to 200 milligrams, make sure your vitamin D is optimized. Those are some of the tricks that I use to kind of help folks uh, navigate through statin therapy. They're really good. They not only lower the LDL cholesterol, but they also stabilize plaque, reduce pl uh, vessel inflammation. They do a lot of other things uh, beyond lowering cholesterol. Um, Non-statin alternatives, and we have a now a lot. And so we have a lot of tools in our toolbox, which is fortunate. One is azetamide, which binds to cholesterol in the gut. Uh, more recently is something called Nexostol or Nexlazet, which actually is a prodrug and prevents synthesis or production of cholesterol in the, in the liver, similar to statins, but in a different mechanism, uh, but is not as powerful as statins, but they uh, it, it is a good option. And then uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors or modifiers, and these are injectable drugs. So Repatha and Pralient are monoclonal antibodies, and they are phenomenal drugs. Um, they lower the cholesterol, the LDL by 50 or 60%. They actually lower the LP little a as well and they have amazing outcome studies. They're expensive, and uh, the challenge is navigating through insurance and, and economics uh, for these drugs. And then Lecvio is probably the newest kid in the block, uh, and it's a drug that, uh, that your provider will inject every six months uh, after two booster doses, 
and um, it lowers the cholesterol by 40, 50% as well and can lower the LP little a. So I bring this to you to say a lot of tools in our toolbox to manage folks uh, uh, across the spectrum of, of uh, hypercholesterolemia and FH in particular. So with that, I'm gonna conclude at 6.11. So I think we have some time for questions and comments. I don't see any yet, but I, well, we hope, you know, wait and see if anyone has any. I, I did have a question about early diagnosis. Um, is it a problem, do you think, in the country to get children diagnosed at such a young age? And is it an issue that people aren't finding out that they have FH until maybe their teens or their young 20s because they just don't get cholesterol tests done? They may not be seeing their doctor regularly. Is that an issue at all? Yeah, no, it is an issue because I think there's not that awareness. And we think of cholesterol as an adult problem. And and so it's not part, probably part of the framework of pediatricians who would be the ones checking these numbers. And, and, and not to say, I mean, I, I think if you look at countries outside the U.S., they do a much better job of screening uh, an earlier age in the United States. And we, we tend to do things later. I mean, certain things we do amazingly well, but for this condition, not so much. And so it's raising awareness. Um, and so there's, you know, the opportunity is reverse cascade testing. So if we're going to test these, if we test kids earlier, then if we find something, we can gene test them and then test their parents and, and then their siblings. And, and that's also a big win. I think the win that I would hope for now is that we raise awareness in adults so that then we can cascade downwards towards their children and start to raise awareness. So it's just going to, it's going to take time. Yeah. So more webinars like these and more information yeah. like this, getting out there to our members who can spread the word in their communities too. Right. Um, it's all about being proactive, right? So that's the key. Yeah. That's what MHI does best, proactive and um, getting the word out. So we do have um, an anonymous attendee asks, is it necessary to stay on a high dose statin of 80 milligrams for life after a heart attack? If you could take that to a general picture, I guess. Yeah, um, no. So I, I think statin after a heart attack from data from a, a trial that was a post heart attack trial and then, um, and there may be some value early on, uh, but after that, I, I, I don't think there's any long-term data that says, hey, you need to stay on a high dose statin. I see my colleagues, my partners do that. And I think it's just fraught with challenges. So um, I try to reduce the statin dose once I know they're a goal. And then if they're not a goal, I'll add on other therapy. Because I know, I know over, over years, people are gonna have side effects. Thank you. Uh, Marv is asking about how helpful is exercise with reducing cholesterol? So exercise uh, from a pure cholesterol perspective probably doesn't have that much impact. You know, we think about HDL, the quote unquote good cholesterol and that exercise can improve it. HDL is poorly understood. And um, even people with really good HDL can have events, cardiovascular events. So I think exercise is good regardless, right? Because it, it's, it's really important. Whether it actually reduces cholesterol uh, is challenging. The only thing I would say is that from the whole panel looking at triglycerides, which are an index of insulin resistance and prediabetes, that weight training, resistance training can improve insulin sensitivity and reduce triglycerides. So that might help indirectly, but LDL cholesterol, probably not. Thanks. Um, I think this is a good question because he's asking, he says he's 76 years old, has had a card, uh, heart attack, cardiac arrest at 62, has a pacemaker, good cardiologist, does it make sense for, I guess, him or her to have genetic testing? Because I think a lot of maybe our members kind of fit this picture and they're yeah. wondering, could they possibly help their family members by getting genetic testing done when they're a little older? So I think at 62, you know, you have to, when you had your first event, and I would just generally say is, you know, what were your numbers before? And 
So it kind of depends. You know, I, I, I think that if the numbers were really high, if there was suspicion for FH at that point, then I think it makes sense to do genetic testing. You know, I mean, the vast majority of folks uh, don't have FH. And so um, it's not cheap and I wouldn't advocate that for general screening. So it kind of depends on if there are other features at that time, you know, were there other family members that had a heart attack around 60? What was the LDL at, you know, prior to the heart attack? Um, and then were there any other features? And if there's any question, then it makes sense to, to go ahead and, and then take the next step and do a gene test because that could help somebody. Thanks. Um, Chuck asks, are injectables statins? No, the injectable drugs are not statins. So everything that I referred to on that slide that wasn't a statin uh, is not a, is uh, everything below that, they are not statins. Thank you. I I think that's it for the questions. Oh, one more just popped in. Oh, so uh, this attendee says they had good cholesterol, but still had a heart attack in their early 40s. Should they have their children tested? And what testing should the, this person look for? Yeah, so the, you know, cholesterol is always in the eye of the beholder, right? And, and patients said, oh, my cholesterol is always good. Well, what does that mean? Uh, uh, and don't tell me about your total cholesterol because I don't care about that. I want I want to know the 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 components. What's your LDL? What was your triglycerides? Did they check an LP little a? And and then based on that, um, in that person with a normal cholesterol that had a heart attack probably doesn't have FH, right? So it probably doesn't make sense to to test them or any of their children. But there may be other factors there. Thank you. Okay. Any last questions? Our comments. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Kapati. Again, you've been such a, a wealth of information for us. And thank you to all the attendees for being on. I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Bye bye.